Great, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, I, I see some familiar faces from our Zoom meeting in January. I'm actually joining you tonight from San Diego. I'm at a conference. Um, the Society for Military Historians meets once a year, and we're meeting this weekend in San Diego, and today's the first day of the conference um, kicking off. So I hear that it never rains in Southern California, but it is raining in San Diego today. So um, alas, but it will be a good conference, a lot of good Civil War stuff on the program too. But tonight I'm gonna sh uh, share with you my PowerPoint slide. So I'll toggle over and screen share. Okay. I think y'all can see my PowerPoint slide. Um, tonight, we're continuing the um, winner of George Meade, I think that we're calling it. Um, I met with you all in January, and then I think last month in February, Jeff Hunt talked with you about some of the fall campaigns in Virginia in 1863. And we're gonna continue that narrative tonight by moving into George Meade and the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. So I've got about uh, 50 some slides. You're pretty familiar with my presentation style from January. And I wanna talk with you about what Meade experiences in the winter of 1864, when he is called before Congress to testify to the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. This is one of the chapters in my Meade book. I was um, not 100% sure what all this testimony would reveal when I started researching for this chapter, but I hope, at least by the presentation tonight, you'll find this a pretty compelling part of Meade's tenure as commander of the Army of the Potomac, and really underscores just how politically volatile the, the Army of the Potomac is, particularly, but also the nature of the American Civil War, um, specifically a democracy fighting a civil war. So before we jump into the joint committee specifically, I want to start with a couple background comments, um, a few kind of framing issues to get us intellectually situated for Meade's testimony. You all heard me, or at least I, I know some of you did, um, were with me in January when I talked about the Army of the Potomac and the pursuit from Gettysburg. So hopefully you have that in your mind. You doubled up then with Jeff Hunt and you have a little bit of a sense of what the fall of 1863 was like for the Army of the Potomac and for George Meade. But I'll make just a kind of a general point here to springboard us to the Joint Committee. In the months following the Gettysburg campaign offered General Meade his first opportunity to really plan independent operations. And this will see a lot of maneuvering back and forth across the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, leading to some fighting at places like Bristow Station or the aborted Mine Run campaign in late November 1863. This is a pretty volatile period for Meade. Um, personally, he's really dissatisfied with the nature of the war and kind of the meddling that he's getting from Washington, D.C., um, he will offer to resign numerous times in the fall of 1863, and it's a period for Meade that really amplifies this discord between the Lincoln administration and the Army of the Potomac and how he thinks that the war should be conducted. So I tell you that just to give you a, a very quick one slide kind of background that gets us thinking about Meade's situation in the final months of 1863, transitioning to 1864. One thing that Meade's gonna get involved in, in the fall of 1863, aside from these campaigns in central Virginia, is a little known incident called the McClellan Testimonial. If, if some of you maybe are familiar to this or um, some might not be, this is in September of 1863, the Army of the Potomac takes up a collection, um, a testimonial for George McClellan, intended or at least speculated a monetary donation that will you be used to promote or support McClellan's 1864 presidential bid. 
And George Meade will support this political campaigning. And he, in fact, will donate $20 to the McClellan testimonial. And different units throughout the Army of the Potomac will raise a, a tremendous amount of money to turn around and give to McClellan. This is gonna generate some discord within the ranks, uh, particularly among some Republicans, um, junior officers and senior officers. And the word of the Army of the Potomac, um, Meade included and the men within, raising money for the presumed Democratic candidate for the 1864 election is gonna make its way to Washington, DC. And Meade is gonna be called to Washington to sort of explain what this testimonial is and he's gonna be sent back down to his army and ordered to squash it. And the money that some soldiers donated to the testimonial will be refunded. One soldier calls this a shameful electioneering subterfuge and Salmon P. Chase calls it an insult to the president. Why I'm telling you this is because this is September, 1863. This is a moment that reflects poorly on me he has miscalculated in endorsing the testimonial, and it looks like he's supporting the presumed Democratic candidate for the 64 election, George B. McClellan, who has been a longstanding target, a popular target for the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. This committee is established in mid December 1861. You might be familiar with this. Um, established initially to look into federal defeats on the battlefield, such as Ball's Bluff. And you can read the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, the testimonies. And this is where I do a lot of the primary research for the Meade uh, testimony here in the winter of 63 and 64 in their published reports. The Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War invests the gates, any number of topics. Of course, we're going to talk about Mead here tonight, but they will investigate Ball's Bluff, like I mentioned. They will investigate um, West Point, essentially, is looked at as being an incubator for these conservative democratic tendencies. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of War, Benjamin Wade, says if there had been no West Point Military Academy, there would have been no rebellion. They will investigate people like um, John uh, Fitz John Porter, um, the man here on the PowerPoint, Balls Bluff, as I mentioned, also shown in the PowerPoint. And they will scrutinize military officers, primarily men in the Army of the Potomac, for their conservative democratic political allegiances. A popular figure for the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is George McClellan. Um, of course, McClellan and the Army of the Potomac, um, perhaps the most volatile army, politically volatile army in American military history. And the Army of the Potomac has slowly excised the ghosts of McClellan, but McClellan still very much casts a shadow over the Army of the Potomac and his conciliatory philosophy of war uh, very much at odds with some of the more Republican leaning or radical progressive officers within that army. Uh, people like Abner Doubleday, who's going to play a prominent role in Meade's testimony, um, Oliver Otis Howard, and Carl Schurz. These are men who will um, promote this idea that the Army of the Potomac is wrapped into what they call pro-slavery cliques. Um, they don't explicitly state as much, but they very much hint that people like George Meade are um, ambivalent, close to calling them a traitor to the Union by not embracing more radical Republican ideologies. So the Joint Committee has been busy by the time they turn to investigate Meade. They have been busy by the time they get to investigating Meade and he's, his leadership in the Army of the Potomac. Meade's gonna be investigated in the winter of 1863, 1864. It's gonna be the 38th Congress that will do the investigation of Meade. 
and it will consist of seven members. Now, not all seven members are going to be at each of these hearings. Um, sometimes only one member will be there, sometimes two or sometimes three. And by and large, the committee is dominated by Republicans. And there are two particularly who will be um, antagonistic or have a fair amount of animus towards General Meade. Um, one is the senator that we're looking at here, Benjamin Wade from Ohio. And the other one is Senator Zachariah Chandler. I'll show you on the next slide. Meade, by and large, will have um, some allies on the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War in the way of a Democrat from New York, Moses Adele, and a Republican from Massachusetts, um, Daniel Gooch, and a Republican Senator from Illinois, Benjamin Harding. So there are some members of the committee who were, uh, Meade says friendly, um, sympathetic to Meade's position, but the two most prominent members on the committee, Zachariah Chandler and Benjamin Wade, very much are antagonistic to Meade. And I wanted to mention Chandler um, with a quick background comment. Zachariah Chandler and Meade's relationship predates this investigation here in 1863 and 1864. When the Civil War began, George Meade is in Detroit, Michigan. He's a captain in April of 1861, working on the topographical engineers um, doing some survey work out at the Great Lakes. And he's watching the secession crisis unfold from Detroit, firing on Fort Sumter, subsequent battle at First Bull Run, Meade is in Detroit. And Zachariah Chandler will mandate, the senator from Michigan, he will mandate that all regular army officers serving in his state, Michigan, take another loyalty oath. And Meade refuses. This is April of 1861. Meade refuses to publicly take another oath to the Union, a loyalty oath, stating that a politician such as Zachariah Chandler cannot command or demand that he or any other officer in the federal army take a loyalty oath. And that gets Chandler's ire. Uh, Chandler will target Meade, uh, speculating that his refusal underlies uh, disloyalty or sentiments that are disloyal. And here now in 1863 and 1864, Chandler has an opportunity to use the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War as a platform to expose Meade's disloyalty or certainly his mediocrity as a general. Now, some people certainly look at Chandler and recognize his motives for what they are. This is the Detroit Free Press that I'm quoting here on March 6th, saying that the same astute military senators who sit in the Senate, they read speeches to empty benches, are brave in words only and resort to all sorts of innuendos to weaken popular confidence in any man. Uh, very much the Detroit Free Press is a pro-Mead newspaper, and they see Chandler's motives as being purely political. So what the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is investigating, um, they're going to look at Meade's leadership from the Gettysburg campaign through to the Mine Run campaign. Most of the questions and most of the testimony that the congressmen are going to hear center on Gettysburg. And if y'all read through the con congressional reports and you look into these testimonies, you'll see that basically the arguments can be distilled to, to two big points. Um, one big point is that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. That's accusation number one, that he had no intention to fight there. And people who will push this argument, and we'll see this in my next couple slides, will point to the Pipe Creek Circular 
as evidence that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. And they will point to the July 2nd Council of War as evidence that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. Then the second big topic or accusation that comes out in the testimonies is that Meade failed to pursue from Gettysburg. His, his pursuit was lethargic and he had the opportunity to del deliver a decisive crushing blow along the banks of the Potomac River there in mid-July 1863 and he failed to do so. So all the people that are gonna be traipsed in to DC through these winter months essentially are getting at these two points. Now, I'd like you to think about something, um, maybe an obvious point, but we'll make it here. Meade is defending victory. The Congressional Committee is investigating a general who won the Battle of Gettysburg. And I can't think of any other moment in American military history where an American general is forced to such an extent to defend his success. And, and that's the position that Meade finds himself in here in late 63, early 64. So we might ask then, what does the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War want? What do they want to get out of this? You all know how this story ends. Even if you don't know a lot of the details of the testimonies themselves, you know that Meade is not going to be relieved of command. But what the committee wants, their objective, gold standard, is to compile enough evidence, enough evidence from these generals to show a compelling case that Meade is unfit to command the Army of the Potomac. And if they can prove that, they're going to ask Lincoln to reinstate Joe Hooker as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Now, that should give us some pause, that the committee's intention is to replace a winning general, Meade, with Hooker, who lost at Chancellorsville. It's antithetical. And it might seem bizarre in 2023 to even consider this notion, but let me suggest this. If you think about Hooker's career, yes, of course, he's relieved of command or he resigns on, on uh, June 28, 1863, but Lincoln is not completely done with Hooker. Lincoln will ask Meade if he would take Hooker as a corps commander and install him as a corps commander. Meade ultimately says no when he realizes he has a choice in the matter. And then Lincoln is gonna have to find something to do with Hooker. So Joseph Hooker will take the Army's 11th and 12th Corps and send be sent west. So there's this moment in 63 where it looks like Hooker's star might be on the rise again. So what these testimonies are intended to do, and you'll see this when we walk through a couple of them, in part is to rehabilitate Hooker's reputation. And if you're gonna rehabilitate Joseph Hooker's reputation, you have to um, weaken Meade's or you have to tear down Meade in order to rehabilitate Hooker. And all this is so carefully orchestrated. It is so carefully orchestrated. 15 generals will testify between February and April, 1864. So this is the time that the Army of the Potomac is sitting in central Virginia, 15 generals, not including Meade. And I've got them organized on my PowerPoint slide. Generally speaking, as generals who are favorable to Meade and generals who are not. And the group that are not, the ones that are really critical of Meade and his leadership, um, probably no surprise, consists of Dan Sickles, Doubleday, Abner Doubleday, Albion Howe, Alfred Pleasanton, David Bell Burney, Dan Butterfield, Meade's chief of staff, and James Wadsworth. 
generals who testify before Congress who by and large are favorable, give favorable accounts of Meade's leadership, Governor Kay Warren, John Gibbon, Henry Hunt, Samuel Crawford, Seth Williams, uh, John Sedgwick, uh, Andrew Humphreys, and Winfield Scott Hancock. I want to share with you how the testimony starts. We're not going to go through all 15 of these. I want to work through it a little bit more thematically. But the testimony kicks off with Dan Sickles, the first person to testify to the Joint Committee of Conduct of the War is Major General Dan Sickles. So imagine this, you are certainly familiar with Sickles' role at Gettysburg, the forward movement on July the 2nd of the Third Corps, which cost Sickles his leg, this severe discord between Meade and Sickles. Um, Sickles has an opportunity here in his testimony to really damage Meade's reputation. And he will emphasize um, less the pursuit, um, Sickles focuses more on the fact in his mind, his argument that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. And if you look through his testimony, he will argue that uh, he, Dan Sickles, had to beg, beg General Meade to move the Army of the Potomac from Maryland up into Pennsylvania to concentrate all seven infantry corps at Gettysburg, that Sickles begged me to offer battle at Gettysburg. And then he will really emphasize in his testimony the role of the Third Corps and how imperative it was for him to move his 9,000 some men forward on July the 2nd to assume that what he calls, quote, commanding ground. You all probably know this, how Sickles reimagines what happens on July the 2nd and really privileges his generalship in a way in which he casts it to basically save the Army of the Potomac on July the 2nd through his brilliant move forward into places like the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, and Devil's Den. Sickles is going to be the first voice that these congressmen, these senators hear. He's really going to set the stage for what's to come. Now, at this time in February of 1864, Sickles is not with the Army of the Potomac. Um, he will ask to be reinstated to field command. He wants his third corps command back, and he will actually uh, move or travel down to Fairfax, Virginia, and he meets with Meade on October the 18th. And he asks if Meade will reinstate him as third corps commander. Meade, of course, says no. Um, he says that Sickles is not well enough and he's not healthy enough to, to command a corps in the field. So Sickles knows that as long as Meade is in command of the Army of the Potomac, he is not going to have a field command. So in the course of his testimony, then, Sickles really works to craft up Hooker. He really works to reimagine the Battle of Chancellorsville in a way that shows Hooker's strengths. And I want to share with you um, one of those exchanges. A question comes from the Joint Committee. Will you state, in your opinion as a military man, was it not a very rash and hazardous movement to displace the commanding officer of the army while in the vicinity of the enemy and on the eve of battle, as was the case when General Hooker was relieved. And Sickles will respond, and he says, at the time I considered it a misfortune to the army and apprehended that disaster might result from it. We'll see this in a couple places tonight too, but the joint committee asks very leading questions. And I know some of you on the PowerPoint, um, on the Zoom call tonight are lawyers and you have 
real practical experience in this in your own work in your own career but my goodness is that a leading question or what so when i mentioned about these testimonies being so verily orchestrated and and crafted this is a perfect example i do this as a professor in the classroom too right if you want your students to answer a question in a particular way you have to ask the question in a particular way right you need to ask the question to get the response that you want and here they're asking a question that is rehabilitating joe hooker at the expense of course of george mead Sigel's testimony is going to be followed by another very vocal Mead critic, and that is Major General Abner Doubleday. He's the second person to testify before the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Now, Doubleday, as you recall, will start the Gettysburg Campaign commanding a division in the First Corps, but on July the 1st, after Reynolds falls mortally wounded, Doubleday will temporarily take command of the 1st Corps. Performs, by all accounts, pretty well on July the 1st. But then Meade will replace Doubleday with John Newton. And this will infuriate Doubleday. When Meade was given command of the Army of the Potomac, he was also given the latitude to promote officers like Newton, regardless of seniority. And this is something that will not sit well with Doubleday. He will return to division command. And then shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg, he's going to be shelved and will be in Washington, D.C. So like Sickles, this is someone that very much has a professional axe to grind against the commanding general. I'll mention, too, that Doubleday is a vocal abolitionist, and his brother commands a unit in the United States Colored Troops. So this is an opportunity to really get at that um, conservative, democratic officer cadre that permeates the Army of the Potomac. This is an opportunity for these radical Republicans to really poke at that perception. So... Doubleday is going to take charge here and accuse Meade, similar to what Sickles did, of not wanting to fight at Gettysburg. Here he says that it is just inexplicable that Meade could hear the thunder of battle all day without riding up from Tawnytown to see what was going on. So here's this notion of Meade being lethargic, uh, reluctant to fight at Gettysburg. They'll also push Doubleday on the pursuit. Question, after the repulse of the enemy, were our troops so much exhausted by the three days fighting that it was impossible for them to follow up the enemy vigorously? Doubleday replies, I have no idea why they were not pursued. I believe the Sixth Corps had not been very actively engaged at least not so much as the other corps. They were comparatively fresh and could have been thrown upon the enemy. Well, Doubleday's right about the Sixth Corps not being very actively engaged. They lose less than 2% casualties during the battle, but that first sentence is just blasphemy. I have no idea why they were not pursued. Of course they were pursued. We talked about that in January. So he's crafting this notion of a lethargic, half-hearted pursuit that other generals are going to continue that thread. They're going to continue that exact argument. And that's going to be the third person to testify. The third person to testify is Brigadier General Albion Howe. And this might seem like a curious choice. Why are they bringing in a, a kind of obscure <laughs> division commander to testify to Congress? Albion Howe of the Sixth Corps. Um, he is someone like Doubleday and like Sickles who finds himself without command in the winter of 1863. Um, the previous month, right before he testifies, 
Meade will transfer Howe out of the Army of the Potomac and put him into the officer of, Office of Inspector of Artillery in Washington. So Hal sees this as an opportunity to uh, settle some professional disputes. And the Joint Committee is pleased to have Hal's testimony because he is an officer in the Sixth Corps. So the Sixth Corps, we learned in January, is really the tip of the spear on the pursuit. And Hal is going to give, uh, for two days, he testifies March 3rd and 4th, really the most in-depth discussion that the Joint Committee has heard about the days after the Battle of Gettysburg, leading to the events at Falling Waters and Williamsport. And he will conclude that Meade should have attacked. When Lee had dug in around Williamsport, Meade had an opportunity to attack and he let that opportunity slip from his hands. He pushes that a little bit further and he says that there is a want of heart and earnest of purpose in the man who is in command. So very much suggesting that Meade doesn't have the heart, the drive, the motivation, the honor, the courage, however you want to describe it, to push the Confederates and really see this war to its ultimate conclusion. So Howe will craft some of these canards about the pursuit, about it being slow, about the pace being languid, missed opportunities along the Potomac in a way in which we still live with 160 years later. All these mischaracterizations they're spinning these webs now. And Howe's also one that's going to give the, the radical Republicans on the committee particularly um, come kind of an account of what they want to hear. The questions asked to Howe, take the other division, um, take the other officers, commanders of divisions, brigades, and the colonels, do they retain full confidence in the ability of the commanding general? So very carefully crafted question. And Hal says, I do not think that they have the full confidence in the ability or state of mind of General Meade. And he puts a little bit of nuance in, I do not think they have, I will not say confidence, but faith in him. They do not expect from him what the crisis seems to call for. So that first part that I've pulled out from the testimony is, is really the golden phrase of what the committee wanted to hear. That the men in the Army of the Potomac, the rank and file, and the officer cadre, they lack faith and confidence in the commanding general. That's the golden phrase that they want to hear. So by March 4th, Sickles, Doubleday, and Albion Howe have given the radical Republicans, like Zachariah Chandler, enough ammunition that they go to President Lincoln and ask Lincoln to relieve Meade of command. That's on March the 4th. They present the case from Sickles, Doubleday, and Howe to President Lincoln. They ask for him to relieve Meade of command, and Lincoln, of course, says no. Now, this might be surprising in some ways because Lincoln has had no qualms in the past of relieving officers of command, McClellan, Burnside, and Hooker, but he does not find the case compelling enough. Certainly the stakes of the, the victor of Gettysburg, imagine that what they're offering here is just not convincing enough. So the radical Republicans like Wade and Howe will go back and they'll continue to call in more witnesses. They'll continue to call in more witnesses. As this is going on, this is March 4th, George Meade will arrive in Washington, D.C. He arrives on the 4th. He's visiting D.C., comes up from Brandy Station to talk with the Lincoln administration about the reorganization of the Army of the Potomac. He's talking about this impending reorganization. Meade knows nothing about the Joint Committee hearings until he gets to DC. And when he arrives, 
and he's walking around the streets of Washington, he hears people just constantly gossiping and talking about what's going on in the halls of Congress. And he writes to Margaret on March the 6th, uh, two days after he gets there, he says, the streets and the bar rooms are all agog with the news. And he's hearing that some of his officers are testifying to Congress about him and about his leadership. And he calls these, in that same letter, grave charges. So Meade, since he's in DC, has an opportunity to defend himself. And he will go before the Joint Committee on March the 5th. Meade ultimately testifies to the committee three times. Uh, March the 5th is the first time, then he comes back about a week later on the 11th, testifies again, and then he'll come back on April 4th for his third testimony. The first and the second one are really the most interesting. The one on March the 5th, Meade testifies to Congress for about three hours, and he wasn't expecting to testify to Congress, so he doesn't have anything prepared. He doesn't have any of his reports. He doesn't have uh, copies of any of his orders. He will go in and testify um, kind of off the cuff, extemporaneous for three hours. And it's, it's really remarkable how well he does. And with such detail that he recalls the, the, the specifics of the Gettysburg campaign without notes to rely on or without these orders to rely on. So in he goes, um, kind of into the, the lion's den or the devil's den. And he's going to take those big charges didn't want to fight at Gettysburg, didn't pursue, and he's going to defend himself. He's going to defend himself. He will give plenty of evidence, uh, certainly compelling evidence, that he did intend to fight at Gettysburg. And what Sickles is saying and what Doubleday is saying is absolutely a mischaracterization. He will say that he never gave an order to retreat. This is something that um, really Doubleday and Butterfield particularly are gonna emphasize that Meade had this order to retreat from Gettysburg in place and was ready to implement it. Meade says there was no such order. Why would I put the Army of the Potomac, move them to Gettysburg on July the 1st to turn around then and order them to retreat? That he says is entirely incomprehensible. He's really going to have to explain the Pipe Creek Circular. He's really going to have to explain that as a contingency plan because people like Sickles and people like Doubleday have characterized the Pipe Creek Circular in a way that it emphasizes that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. He has to explain that as a fallback plan it's a contingency plan. It's a line laid out that if everything goes completely uh, bad for the Army of the Potomac, my corps can fall back to these prescribed designated positions and hold a line along Pike Creek in Maryland. Meade is really going to have to defend his use of councils of war. I talked with you about this in January, but this is a huge point of contention to the Joint Committee. Councils of War, to some, look weak. They look like Meade is not prepared to act on his own authority and that he wants to solicit input from his subordinates about what the Army should do. And the one council that gets a lot of discussion among these witnesses is the Council of War on July the 2nd. And this council, this is at the Leicester House, it's what we're looking at in the image, the Gardner image, on the night of July the 2nd is characterized by Meade critics as being where Meade intended to tell his subordinates that he was going to withdraw from Gettysburg. This is wrapped into this order that Meade supposedly wrote to retreat and that he was bringing his corps commanders to the Leicester House to tell them to prepare to retreat or withdraw from Gettysburg. This is a interpretation of the Council of War that's still pretty popular among some Meade critics today, including um, historians who have written on this topic. But fortunately, 
Mead, we have the evidence, writes to Halleck at eight o'clock on July the 2nd, and he very explicitly says, I shall remain in my present position tomorrow, but I'm not prepared to say whether that will be an offensive nature or a defensive nature. So for the critics who say that Meade convened his council of war, it lasts three some hours, intending to withdraw, Meade can point to that message to Halleck at eight o'clock. And this is particularly um, Dan Butterfield's testimony on this, the July 2nd Council of War is really damaging. He says that Meade had ordered him to prepare in order to withdraw from Gettysburg when it was gonna be used as sort of a matter of debate. But we also know um, Butterfield is the one that recorded the questions and the minutes from that Council of War on the night of July the 2nd. So when Butterfield testifies, um, this is really gonna make me anxious about how, mis in what ways it's being mischaracterized what that Council of War was intended to be and how disingenuous Butterfield is in talking about the Council of War to the Joint Committee. In regards to the pursuit, uh, Meade is gonna take this and work to defend himself, that he in fact did pursue from Gettysburg um, to the best of the condition of the Army of the Potomac would allow. Other people like um, John Sedgwick, I'll show you in a second, will support Meade's actions in that 10 day pursuit. He will have to defend the use of a council of war at Falling Waters on July the 12th. Meade says that these are consultations. Um, he, he doesn't call them councils of war, he calls them consultations. And he ju justifies when the uh, congressmen like poke at him, why are you calling so many of these councils of war? Meade justifies and he says, he's so new to command. He's so new to command that he didn't feel the authority of making the decisions without gaining input and advice from his subordinates. So these consultations are an opportunity for him to gather information from his core commanders, understand the situation that lies before him better, then make a decision. So he refutes the accusation that these councils of war show weakness or cautious leadership. The part of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War with the Pursuit is really interesting in the way in which different eyewitnesses emphasize different parts of the pursuit. Now, some people who are generally favorable to Meade in their testimony criticize him on the pursuit. And one such person is uh, Governor K. Warren. When Warren is called to testify, he says that Meade in fact should have attacked the Confederate line along the Potomac River. Um, James Wadsworth, Albion Howe, we've already talked about. David Bell Burney is very critical of me during the pursuit. Wadsworth says, now of course this is in retrospect, he says they should have attacked. The Army of the Potomac should have attacked. The question is asked to James Wadsworth, a vigorous attack on our side with our army in good spirits, as you say they were, must have been destructive to Lee's army under any circumstance. Wadsworth says, I believe almost everybody in the army admits that now. Uh, Wadsworth will be at that July 2nd Council of War in place of John Newton, who was sick to represent the First Corps. The support for me during the pursuit come from people like John Sedgwick. Now, Sedgwick, of course, is an authority because it's the Sixth Corps that will be the tip of the spear in the pursuit. And when Sedgwick testifies on April the 8th, he said it would have been very advantageous to have attacked him, Lee, while he was withdrawing, but not when he was in position there. I believe if we had attacked him, we would have received a severe repulse. Sedgwick's testimony, of course, carries tremendous weight as the commander of the Sixth Corps. 
So these 15 officers are parading in and out February, March into early April. And I'm gonna make just a, a tiny detour for a minute and check the, check the time. Um, a tiny detour to overlay other things that are going on for Meade and within the Army of the Potomac at the exact same time. So let's put some layers to the Joint Committee. Let's add a little bit of texture or nuance. The Second Battle of Gettysburg is in full steam. This is the, the debates about the Battle of Gettysburg playing out in the newspaper. A Mead star, certainly its highest of highs come July 5th, 6th, and then we'll get to the lowest of lows with frustrations about the pursuit, supposed missed opportunities come mid-July as Lee escapes back into Virginia. Mead writes about how, how all this is playing out in the newspaper on December the 7th with an often quoted letter um, to his wife, Margareta, and he says, I see the Herald is constantly harping on the assertion that Gettysburg was fought by corps commanders and the common soldier, and that no generalship was displayed at all. I suppose after a while, it will be discovered I was not at Gettysburg at all. Of course, the newspapers are battlegrounds for reputation. Of course, the newspapers are places where reputations and images and public opinion is being shaped. And there's a very favorable account of Meade's generalship that will be published in a newspaper in New York called The Round Table on March the 12th. And it's an editorial titled, Ought General Meade Be Removed? And the answer to that, according to this writer, is no. And he says, we have changed commanders too often. With the exception of General Meade, each change has been for the worse. And in the course of this editorial, this person will amplify all of Meade's strengths and encourage people to recognize that the right man is in command of the Army of the Potomac. Unfortunately, that round table article is published at the same time the historicus account is published in the New York Herald. Now, we could do an entire roundtable discussion on the Meade-Sickles controversy. That's certainly worth its own hour. But this is going on at the same time the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War and the testimonies are unfolding in Washington. Largely presumed to be written by Dan Sickles. This is a very long-winded diatribe about the Third Corps and, and the role that it played at the Battle of Gettysburg, published under the pseudonym Historicus. Meade certainly expects that this is Sickles, and it is Sickles at work, and he will ask uh, Halleck to redress this in some way, and, and he doesn't receive any kind of friendly or empathetic ear from Halleck, but this adds to the turmoil in Washington. And it kicks off a very furious debate in the newspapers about Meade's leadership. Um, James Barnes, um, commander in the Fifth Corps, will offer a rebuttal. Um, various other officers and common soldiers will offer rebuttals to what Historicus is claiming. And Meade's reputation is, is being discussed. It's largely being debated here in newspapers for consumption and absolutely shapes his image and impacts how we remember him today. Certainly this all weighs a lot on Meade, um, very much weighs on him. And he writes to his wife on the 16th, I do not believe in the policy of keeping perfectly silent and allowing your enemies to poison the public mind without making some effort to place the truth before them. This is all I intend to do. Meade cares very deeply about his reputation. He is a uh, voracious reader of newspapers and he very much cares about what's being said about him in the newspaper. So he follows, of course, this Historicus account. He follows the second battle of Gettysburg being played out in the newspaper. 
and he looks for ways to set the record straight. But the fact that so much of his leadership is still contested today um, suggests that the Second Battle of Gettysburg and people like Sickles and Astorgas were successful in crafting a particular image of the commanding general. So I have a few points and I see the um, chat box kind of um, amping up here. So I'll be anxious to see what your questions are. I have a few points yet about how this wraps up. Um, it's, it's really an anticlimactic end in many ways. I wanna remind you that as the joint committee hearings are going on, Ulysses S. Grant has been promoted to Lieutenant General. That rank has been revived by Congress. The last, well, the first person and the last person to hold the rank of Lieutenant General, of course, is George Washington. And Grant will be coming east. He will meet with Abraham Lincoln on March the 4th, initially intending to go back west to manage the war and the armies out there, but will change his mind. And as we know, will make his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac. And on March the 10th, Grant will meet Meade at Army of the Potomac headquarters at Brandy Station. And a little perhaps known or overshadowed or passed over moment of that meeting on the 10th is that Grant brings with him Major General William uh, Baldy Smith. And it, it suggests that Grant had intended, was considering replacing Meade with Baldy Smith. Smith, of course, is no stranger to the Army of the Potomac. Then he's gonna be sent to the Western Theater and becomes a bit of a, a Grant crony, if you will. He redeems his reputation a bit. And here he is meeting with Meade on the 10th. Now, Smith is not campaigning to take command of the Army of the Potomac, but it surely makes Meade anxious. And Meade will write a lot about what the presence of Baldy Smith here at this meeting meant. Meade certainly realizes that his job is on the line. The newspapers are constantly speculating that he's gonna be shelved, replaced with someone like Smith, um, uh, Alfred Pleasanton, as his name is circulated, any number of people, and Meade is reading all this and is just constantly fretting about his security. This quote is something that Baldy Smith recounts that supposedly Secretary Stanton said to Grant, General Grant, you're going to the Army of the Potomac and you will find a very weak and irresolute man there. And my advice to you is that you make a change at once. Wow. Um, Baldy Smith and, and George Meade have a long history together, and it is one that is not friendly on either side. So put yourself in George Meade's shoes. There is so much going on in the early weeks and months of 1864, um, right on the eve, right on the outset of the Overland campaign. Meade testifies the third and final time on April the 4th. And the way in which the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War investigation comes to an end is, is quite anticlimactic. It is quite anticlimactic. Um, the cabal will basically go out with a whimper, It'll go out with a whimper. And you can read any number of Union soldier accounts, officers and from the rank and file, and they're very aware about what's going on in Washington. Um, Charles Wainwright, um, familiar no doubt with his published um, diary battle, writes on the 6th that Sickles and Doubleday are responsible for this, and he calls them rascality and stupidity. Um, General Webb, here in my image, says the fool has overreached himself, referring to Dan Sickles. So the Joint Committee goes out with a whimper. But one thing that will improve for the Army of the Potomac, a very politically volatile army, is that the reorganization allows Meade to get rid of many of these agitators, either through the reorganization itself and consolidating of the Corps, 
or just flat out shelving them or transitioning them somewhere else. So Alfred Pleasanton, who was no friend to Meade and his testimony, is of course gonna be replaced by Phil Sheridan. Any other number of people are going to be replaced. Sickles, of course, never comes back. Butterfield is gonna go west with Hooker. Doubleday is not gonna come back to the Army of the Potomac. So these kind of toxic anti-me generals by the start of the Overland campaign are no longer with the Army of the Potomac. And frankly, think about how that um, helps or aids Grant's ability to manage that army. All that discontent and that political volatility that we see really when the war begins, reaches its crescendo under McClellan, and then really permeates into Meade's tenure too, is now absent or silenced because the reorganization and deliberate shelving of those malcontents has created a more stable, at least politically stable army. So I'll leave you with this thought. The joint committee, as I said, goes out with a whimper. It goes out with a whimper. The official report on Meade's leadership will not be published until May of 1865. May 22nd, the report is released. And by this point, at least Appomattox is six months ago, the Civil War is, is over in the Eastern theater at least, and it is nothing more than political theater, right? Grandstanding, a political dog and pony show. They were not able to accomplish their goal in removing meat of command, whether or not you think that they were successful in um, smearing or tarnishing Meade's reputation, there's certainly a case to be made for that. And we can see the legacies of that today in 2023. So I'll leave you a quote with Theodore Lyman who joins Meade's staff in the fall of 63. And he says about how um, sensitive or touchy Meade is to his reputation. Um, on April the 2nd, he says, the old general is a little more cherry of his reputation than he was and a shade more vain. So I'm hopeful that that gives you a little bit of nuance on this civil military relation and the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. I will stop my PowerPoint, I'll stop screen share and I'll um, come over and join you guys and see what questions you all have for me and look through some of the comments and questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Great, great presentation, okay. uh, Professor Murray. And as you would expect, there are a lot of questions um, on this. Wait, it was me... a great presentation. Um, Rich, you yeah. wanted to say something? Yeah, I want to just start off in the beginning. Henry, you cut me off. I didn't introduce Professor Murray. So let me give you your introduction at the end. By the way, that was a just a phenomenal presentation. God knows how many I've heard, but that was... You are so invited back. You have no idea. <laughs> and when your book comes out, I can't wait. Um, Dr. Jennifer Murray is a, a military historian with a special specialization in the American Civil War in the Department of History at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Murray's recent publication is on a, gr a great battlefield, the making and management and memory of Gettysburg National Military Park, published by the University of Tennessee. She's also the author of Civil War Begins, published by the U.S. Army Center of Military History. He is currently working on a full-length biography of General Moore, General uh, Gordon and uh, George Meade. Okay. Uh, in addition to delivering hundreds of Civil War battlefield tours, that got to be a phenomenal tour that you're giving. Um, I, I give my sides. I can't help it. Murray has led World War I and World War II study uh, abroad trips to Europe. She's a veteran faculty member at Gettysburg College's Civil War Institute and a coveted speaker at the Civil War Symposiums and Roundtables. Additionally, Murray worked as a seasonal interpretive park ranger for the National Park Service at Gettysburg National Military Park for nine years. I got to ask you one question before, and it sounds odd, and I, could, I point blank, it's, a, it's really a compliment. The building you work in is the Murray Building. Is that named after you? <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. Yeah. Um, so, so good to make that connection. No, it's not. Um, it's named after a governor of Oklahoma. Murray evidently is a 
kind of a famous name in Oklahoma. Of course, I'm not from Oklahoma. I'm from Pennsylvania and Maryland. But when I took the job and saw that the history department was housed in the Murray building, I thought this is uh, quite the coincidence, isn't it? Or maybe a good sign for me to do good stuff here at Oklahoma State. That was an ultimate compliment I'm paying. I wasn't kidding. I wasn't, I wasn't, <laughs> yeah. was, that was not gratuitous. When you hear a lecture like this, you go, why not? <laughs> you got to see the chat. You have to, yeah. you have to uh, see the chat. Rich, I'll, I'll leave it on to you. Yeah, uh, Rich, um, uh, Ken uh, has has been raising his hand. So, uh, Ken, you're unmuted. Please yes, ask uh, your yes, question. <clears throat> yes, uh, Dr. Murray, uh, great talk. I wish you had been a lecturer at the War College when I, Air Force War College, when I was there with Henry Hetzel uh, back in 98. Um, but my comment or my um, my um, uh, comment is, um, I happen to have a, an original copy of the very same um, conduct of the war that you quoted from. And what struck me was very interesting in the testimony of General Howe was that uh, he talked about the, um, the action on July 3rd, uh, Pickett's charge. And he said um, that as far he can, uh, he, um, he did not consider the, um, the action to be of uh, great military um, uh, affair uh, as a battle. And, um, and also that there was, um, uh, as a military operation on our side, no particular credit can attach to it. And he also said that, um, uh, that when the fighting was over, our troops were by no means exhausted and that they were comparatively fresh. And later on, he happened to come across a captured uh, lieutenant from the uh, Confederate Army. Uh, and he, th that uh, same um, prisoner had stated to uh, um, General Howe that um, the um, um, rebel army, uh, that they had but two rounds of ammunition for with the rear guard. So there was um, plenty of indication that the rebels were not um, probably able to counter an attack. So he reported this to General Sedgwick. And the interesting thing was that Sedgwick said that um, he, we don't want to bring on a general engagement. So don't come into contact with the enemy. So there must have been some some indication uh, from the um, from the um, higher up command to not bring on uh, a general engagement with the retreating rebels. So I uh, I was you know that was I, I was wondering if that was a general impression uh, you know throughout. Um, the Union Army that participated uh, in pick charge because I thought that was kind of um, interesting that uh, they didn't think of it much of a, as much of a battle. Yeah, so a couple things on <clears throat> on that, and I see someone in the chat. Was it maybe it was Art? Maybe it was you. You mentioned the um, Union General Speak book, the Bill Hyde account. Bill Hyde has taken the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War testimony and has went through it sort of line by line or at least paragraph by paragraph and has added historical perspective to it. What these people are saying, is it true? Is it embellished? Is it accurate? Is it not? And I really like um, Hyde's account on that because you can look at this testimony in the original like you have in your hand and you can read through it and maybe just take it face value that what they're saying is true. How, as, as many of these people are, are certainly exaggerating, deliberately mischaracterizing, embellishing particular parts of their testimony to support a particular case. And I think the, the Hyde account does a great job was, in giving us that perspective. Do you think he was playing it to the- Wait, wait, wait. Ken, let other people got a lot of questions on. Let okay. other people do it. All right. Okay, all right. Okay, thank Henry, you. Henry, you want to run it or- Sure. Professor Murray. Um, one of the first ones we had was, uh, do you think that Meade did Doubleday a disservice at Gettysburg? 
Yeah, um, Brian, thanks for that comment. And um, Ken, thanks for your comment too about how I appreciate that. I appreciate your comment. Um, by and large, I, and maybe you disagree, but Doubleday by and large does a good job on July the 1st with the situation that he's in, the situation that the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps is in on July the 1st. I think that Doubleday does a good job. I think he does. Now, he and Meade are going to have um, some longstanding animus. And interestingly, Doubleday, after Meade dies, will write, I think it's in the New York Times, um, sort of a postscript to his account and his testimony in the Joint Committee, where he, he kind of apologizes for how he slandered Meade so poorly here in the winter of 1864. And he said, he, he admits that some things that he said were mischaracterized and very much shaped by his bitterness about being shelved for July the 1st and being replaced by Newton. So short answer, yes. And second, second follow-up is um, Doubleday's sort of recognizes how that influenced him and his testimony to Congress, which I think is a fantastic kind of actualization. Um, too bad me didn't live to see it. Uh, another question from uh, Brian, and we have lots of questions, over 20 questions. So I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll give it a try. And I think, uh, Professor, you're always open for people posing questions directly to you also. But um, how much, if any, is Edward Stanton involved in the anti-Mead sentiment? That's a good question. Um, Stanton is definitely annoyed with Mead about the McClellan testimonial. There's pretty conclusive evidence that Stanton is irate that Mead has supported this political electioneering for McClellan. And that sets a bad, kind of a bad taste in his mouth. Um, the question maybe too about like Stanton and his role in the reorganization of the army and how he, the reorganization of the army and the latitude that Meade has to shelve some generals that are antagonistic to him is a great question that we don't have 100% conclusive evidence in what role Stanton played what authority Meade had, because there are some people like George Sykes that Meade wishes that he could keep, but they get cashiered from the army. Is that Stanton's doing? Um, what influence does he have? So that to say, Stanton at different times is supportive of Meade in different ways, but then also sees some frustration with Meade and, and maybe overreaching or stepping a little bit more into these political waters than what he thinks Meade should. That's a great question, though. Yeah. Well, before, yeah. Henry, before we get us started, I just wanted to point out, thanks to uh, Judge Harper, uh, <laughs> Professor Murray, a former Supreme Court Justice from New Jersey, Stuart Pollock, uh, Pollock is watching this program, and we welcome you. So okay, Henry, uh, another uh, good question, Professor Murray, uh, from AH. Uh, did any other general face the same degree of hostility after the uh, Joint Commission uh, that Meade experienced? Um. I think what set, sets me apart, and we could certainly think of like Fitz John Porter. Um, and if, if you're familiar with Bill Marvel has that new biography out on Fitz John Porter, I think came out a couple years ago and he's kind of resurrecting or maybe redeeming Fitz John Porter um, for his actions in the summer of 62. I, I think what sets me apart though, is that Meade is, is defending his victory. And, and I'm willing to hear maybe kind of pushback on this, but I can't think of an, another scenario in American history that's different. And even if you wanna move forward in the 20th century and the way in which the Army McCarthy um, hearings or um, Douglas MacArthur is sort of involved in politics, I can't quite see that as, as analogous. So I would say Meade's case is the exception and it's exceptional because he's brought in to defend success. And we can quibble and argue, and, and we do, which is, this is the, the joy of this, 
about the pursuit from Gettysburg, but you can't argue with the fact that the Army of the Potomac defeated Robert E. Lee at the Battle of Gettysburg in July of 1863. And under Meade's leadership, the Army of the Potomac achieved its first significant victory to date. And now Meade is gonna be testifying to Congress about his success. I can't think of anything that's comparable to that. I cannot think of anything that's comparable to that. Another good question from uh, Abigail uh, is, uh, did Lincoln use his influence on, on, the, on what the community was doing? And was he upset, disturbed, outraged by uh, the, the discussions? Yeah, I like that question. And I've not seen any written record about the conversation between Lincoln and um, Stanton and members of the Joint Committee on March the 4th. I've not seen, they, they listen to Albion Howe, then they go over and talk to Lincoln literally after Howe's walked out on March the 4th after his testimony. They move right to go to Lincoln with this evidence to get Meade relieved. I've never seen any primary source that tells us what was said in that meeting. I've not seen record of that. So we speculate because Meade's not relieved of command, of course, that Lincoln pushes back and he says, it's it's not enough. You, you haven't presented enough for me to relieve the victor of Gettysburg. What's kind of curious about that and if you think of like Lincoln's meddling in political affairs, Lincoln's constant or military affairs, Lincoln's constantly meddling in military affairs. And he does it in a way that he allows like back channel ways to get to him. John Newton, for instance, after the Battle of Fredericksburg will be up in Washington, DC, John Newton saying that Burnside should be relieved of command. So Lincoln entertains or allows for this backstabbing, like divisiveness in the Army of the Potomac by allowing someone like Newton to have an opportunity to air his grievances with him. There's gonna be some good work coming out on Lincoln as commander in chief. And in fact, my dissertation director, Ken No, is working on a book on Lincoln as commander in chief. And I think it's gonna give us a little more nuance to how Lincoln contributes, frankly, to a lot of this dysfunction in the Army of the Potomac. And I certainly think that's true with Meade. Um, here at the Joint Committee and also in the fall of 1863, and Meade's floundering in these operations down through central Virginia. That's a great question. And Lincoln absolutely has a role and we need to understand what that role is and how it contributes to this dysfunction. Um, I, again, we have so many questions. I'm going to ask one or two uh, more, but uh, uh, Ted has a good question about Meade's personality. It was known that he was a very difficult person. And did that, you know, color his staff's views of him? <laughs> um, that's a great question. And man, we could go on some some anecdotes about that. Yeah, we get this notion that Meade is volatile that he's he's the snapping turtle is what he comes down to in history. That, by the way, that old goggle-eyed snapping turtle comes from Horace Porter and it's a secondhand account. I have never seen any primary account during the war of a soldier calling Meade a goggle-eyed snapping turtle. That's secondary and it's post-war. But they call him plenty of things. Uh, they call him old four eyes. They call him old granny. His soldiers write these, these epitaphs about him during the war. But there are many accounts of Meade losing his temper. He loses his temper with Bernie at Fredericksburg. Um, Lyman writes a lot about how irascible Meade is. It seems to me like he's really like a volcano. Like he explodes really quickly and then sort of simmers back down. He explodes with uh, Phil Sheridan in May of 64, uh, very famously at Mount Carmel Church, this big engagement with Sheridan right during the um, Overland campaign. Really vitriolic words exchanged, but then Meade goes over, puts his hand on Sheridan and apologizes to him. So no doubt Meade's temperament is a factor, but so many of these men are 
kind of wired similarly, right? They are similarly temperamental. But whether or not we think it contributes negatively to his command and his leadership, I think is a different question. And, and I personally would say no to that. One Henry, last question. Well, okay, take a last question, then I'll- One last question, okay. um, which I think is interesting. Uh, did the Republican senator, senators continue to push Hooker as commander uh, before the election of 1864? So when Hooker goes west in September with the 11th and 12th Corps, that sort of resolves that situation. It resolves it for Hooker. He sees like he's kind of content with that. And Hooker redeems himself out west in some ways. He's content with that. Meade is happy. He's relieved that he doesn't have to have um, Hooker maybe inserted or reinserted back into the Army of the Potomac. So come September with 11th and 12th Corps going west, that really wraps that up. Now, they could have brought him from the west east, but by the time that is in place, that, that sort of resolved that question. And All one right. last one, a number of people uh, were asking about uh, your book, and when is that going to be available? So I'm working, um, and I maybe mentioned this in January too, working on it. I'm actually in the Overland campaign now. Um, I just wrote a chapter on Meade at Cold Harbor. So um, it's June of 64 in my book. I've got some 15 chapters written and of course the Overland campaign to finish, move into Petersburg. I suspect I'll be writing still through the end of the year. Uh, Meade's role in reconstruction is pretty short and he dies in 1872. So once I get through Appomattox, the rest of the book will come a lot quicker. But the end is in sight. I assure you I'm steadily, I really truly mean this. I appreciate your enthusiasm and, and looking forward to the book that really inspires and motivates me to know that I have an audience ready to read it. And, and I hope that it lives up to its expectations for sure. Yeah, but otherwise you. you had great accolades. The only complaint I heard was it went too fast. The presentation <laughs> went too fast. Yeah. Henry, and, let me and, just say a few words. Okay. I just wanted to wrap up, uh, wrap it up. We have uh, Arthur Crompton on from Australia on this program. So you're all over the world now for the program. Uh, let me just say a few words before, we, again, we thank you. But um, our next meeting will be Bruce Tucker, who will do Admiral in first person of Admiral Farragut at uh, Mobile Bay. And I'm looking for bows and whistle to pipe him into the meeting. And in May, we have M Miley from what, Seminary Ridge, who'll be talking about Pennsylvania 151st at Gettysburg. Okay. Again, to everybody, thank you for attending. And we'll see you next month on the fourth Thursday.